Hello and welcome to my next show. What I'm going to do in this one is show you some uniforms. Now you'll see the, the little miniature on the right is a 72nd scale British infantryman. And here's the, the ones you'll see in my war games if you've been following them. But next to him is a 32nd scale uh, infantryman. And we'll be having a look at these today just to see some of their uniforms and um, bits and pieces of kit. Now this 32nd scale infantry man came from an Airfix collection when I was a young bloke. That Airfix brought out a whole series of uniforms and I collected nearly the entire set. Uh, and you had to put them together, cutting out all the different straps, etc. Which uh, really made for an interesting uh, learning experience especially with the cavalry, which we'll get to later. So what we have here is uh, this uh, larger model is a British Coldstream Guard. But um, if you look, we'll turn him around. As you can see, he's holding a brown Bess musket and he's got his bayonet on, which as you can see, extends his reach out quite a bit. And so when they form square to keep cavalry away, um, they, they did have quite a reach with that bayonet to keep the cavalry from being able to slash them with their swords. He carries his blanket on a pack, a water bottle, ammunition pack, and another little bag there. So, at the end of the day, he's pretty weighted down, but that's his whole world on his back. And... Um, As they wore the uniforms out, it was very tough for them to get new ones. But uh, on parade ground um, specs, you can see it's quite a marvellous uniform. Red coat for typically of British. Uh, the blue epaulettes. Uh, the, his black uh, Shaco hat with his uh, red and white plume on top. Now this little fella down here, he doesn't have the same detail because... Um, we had to paint lots of those to get a battalion to war game with. But um, that's just a comparison of a British infantry man. We'll move on and uh, see what other ones we've got. This next infantry man is a guards infantry. So they're the top of the line, the most experienced, etc. You can see he's... Um, Got his brown vest musket as well. His headdress is a little bit different. Red coat, of course, for the British. General sort of thing that troops had to carry with them. Their, their pack, their bayonet, water bottle, ammunition, a bit of food. And you can see his uniform's quite uh, quite spectacular actually there's a lot of detail a lot of cost went into um, dressing these these troops and the Napoleonic Wars is interesting in that it was the end of the colorful uniforms uniforms were colorful so that the generals could spot their troops at great distance and also so that the enemy could see who they were opposed to uh, and oftentimes that would unsettle them if they knew they had a guard unit in front of them. And of course, on our wargaming table, you will see the, the little uh, 70 second uh, figure there. He's uh, not as, he's not painted quite as uh, detailed. Uh, it's, some people are very good at that. Uh, whereas, as good as I might have been, we had to get numbers out, so uh, we gave them the basic uh, the basic paint job, but uh, you can definitely recognise them on the battlefield, and, and that's the key to the whole thing. So there's the guardsman, quite a quite an impressive figure. Okay, so no prizes for guessing who this chap is. He's a Scottish soldier, of course, and. Uh, once again, he's wearing the kilt, so he's a Highland Scot. The Lowland Scots wore 
kilted um, trousers or they were dressed uh, the same as the British infantry, I believe. Again, he's got the brown vest musket. Uh, same sort of pack on his back, pretty standard blanket, uh, the pack with all sorts of uh, personal gear in, Clo a bit of clothing and uh, water bottle, ammunition pouch, bayonet, and there of course is the 72nd scale model that is used in the wargamings. But, um, you can see quite a bit of the detail in the small one. Mirrors the uh, larger model, of course, but uh, not quite getting down to the the detail of the 32nd scale model. So that's uh, that's a Scottish soldier. Now this uh, infantry man here is particularly interesting for the British Army. <clears throat> First off. You'll notice that instead of the red coat, he's got a dark green uniform with black facings on it. And the only thing that uh, isn't, uh, let's say, of a camouflage nature is his water bottle, uh, blanket and a side pouch. The other really interesting thing here is his, he's got a rifle. It was named the Baker Rifle and it's not a brown vest musket. Now this unit was formed in 1800 by a Colonel Coote Manningham and it was the first uh, really attempt at light troops. The green uniform gave them a degree of camouflage and uh, because they were light troops and specially trained to be, they operated in pairs. Um, where one would be firing while the other uh, loaded. The French actually had a nickname for them, grasshoppers, um, as they darted around the battlefield taking advantage of terrain that they might run across. Now, <clears throat> a normal British line would present their muskets and instead of aiming, they would more point and fire as a mass volley and their accuracy was judged at around about 75 yards. This Baker rifle was as accurate out to 200 yards, which really meant that um, they were a nuisance to whoever they were um, fighting. Uh, they were the best light troops in Europe. They were better than the French Voltigeurs and, and they were classed as being pretty good. French Voltigeurs had muskets that uh, put them at a disadvantage. Now, being a rifle, it had a groove down the barrel, and that's where its accuracy came from. But uh, also, it probably slowed down the reloading uh, a little bit as well, compared to a smooth bore musket, which you could uh, ram that ball down. The Brown Best, for instance, fired a, can a musket ball that was 0.75 inches in diameter, so it's a fairly, fairly sizable chunk of uh, lead to be coming at you. The... Um, but so the Baker rifle might have been a bit slower, but its accuracy made up for any deficiencies. And uh, their job, as I said, was to skip around the battlefield and pick out the officers uh, on horses, the uh, captains, sergeants, corporals, and by uh, stripping away the command structure, it helped demoralize the, the troops. So um, they were very famous uh, and uh, when they're on the battlefield, they really um, are a nuisance to whoever they are opposed to. So that's the, the 95th, and um, there's the 72nd scale model next to them. So uh, if you see them on the battlefield, uh, you might remember who they are. Okay. Now we move over to the French. And here's a French infantry man. As you can see, his equipment, uh, these muskets, uh, bayonet, backpack, blanket, ammunition pouch, very similar to the British. In fact, all soldiers of uh, all the armies at that time um, were fitted out basically the same. Uh, 
Now, he's got a white breeches and a blue coat. And it was generally a rule of thumb that the French had blue coats, the British were red coats, of course, the Prussians were black, the Austrians white, the Russians green. I think that's uh, all the major powers covered there. Um, it helped to distinguish them. And there's the little 72nd scale model. He's quite uh, recognisable on the battlefield with that uniform. Now, this is a, um, a fusilier, because he fires a, a musket. Uh, in the French regiments, there would have been uh, light troops attached to the battalion. And if he were a light uh, trooper, he would have a plume on the front of his uh, shako hat which would have been yellow on the bottom and green on the top. There were also grenadiers attached to the battalion and they would have had it like a bearskin cap with a red plume attached, uh, which makes them quite recognisable. But, uh, we don't have any of those in the 32nd scale model. As I said, we don't have the full range of Napoleonic uh, soldiers from the time, just the sampling that Airfix brought out. And as you can see, they're quite, uh, they were quite decent models at the time, and it was a lot of fun doing them. All right, so that's the, that's the French infantryman. All right, and now we come to the old guard of the French army. Napoleon's personal body of soldiers for his protection. They were feared by everyone who they opposed and with good reason, to get in to the Guard Imperiale, a soldier had to have served at least five years in the army, be five foot eight inches in height, of good character, have been an efficient soldier, and have served in at least two campaigns. Now, and even then, not everyone who applied got in. Uh, as you can well imagine then, these were experienced hardened veterans of Napoleon's wars and that's why they were so effective on the battlefield but because they weren't large in number they weren't used all that often and their last famous charge for anyone in, is interested in Napoleonic Wars was at Waterloo where they were turned back by English volley fire but everywhere else that they um, fought they were very successful and uh, rightly feared. They were looked after better, paid better, had fancy uniforms, and uh, you know, it was quite a uh, an ambition of a, of a soldier to get into the Guards Regiment. So that's the old guard, and uh, you don't often see them in the war games because they are expensive to purchase, and. Um, you know, they just, they, they um, weren't used all that much. All right, so what we've done now is look at um, some infantrymen. Uh, I only have British and French because that's all the airfix um, made. But uh, basically you get the idea of the uniform and it was, as I said, pretty much the same throughout most of the armies. Big musket, uh, bayonet, and uh, on, on their back, they carried their world, so to speak. And uh, the uniforms, uh, as we've gone through the different colours for the French, British, etc. Now we'll switch over to cavalry uh, and have a look at uh, some of the different types of cavalry. Okay, so now we're moving into the cavalry and we're going to start with hussars. This is a British hussar, but uh, Hussars were pretty much the same through all the countries that used them, and everyone had them. Reason? They're light, called, their class is light cavalry, and their main job is scouting, but they were used on the battlefield. They were quick uh, and nimble, uh, but the hitting power wasn't as, as good as heavy cavalry. And now we take a closer look at uh, this figure here, and you'll see... I don't know if you can make it out. His cavalry sword is a curved sword. It's used more for slashing. Heavy cavalry had a straight edge sword, more for stabbing and, and heavy cutting. 
he carried a carbine with him that he uh, could, if he needed to get off the horse and uh, go and inspect a house, for instance, he might uh, take that carbine, load it, and advance with that um, to protect himself. Otherwise, uh, their main weapon, of course, was the sword and their mobility. But uh, as I said, every nation used them. Um, the job of reconnaissance can never be understated to its importance. And um, they, they saw themselves as a rather dashing, elitist sort of um, crew. And as a result, their uniforms were always, in, in every army, quite spectacular. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, an Hazar. He's a British Hazar. But as I said, uh, every nation had them and they were basically the same in fit out. This cavalry man here is a, a dragoon from the British Army. And the term dragoon came from the early days when they carried a pistol that was more like a blunderbuss. And it was called a dragon. Now, of course, they developed. And the idea of dragoons were they were mounted infantry. They could race to a spot, uh, get off their horse, and fight as infantry. And as a result, the weapon he carries is a rather is a traditional musket. It's quite a large weapon to, for him to carry, but that was seen as the role of the dragoon. Now, as they developed, they became actually more heavy cavalry and. Uh, uh, fought as that. You can see his sword is a long straight sword for um, stabbing and slashing and that's that's the sort of uh, symbol of a heavy cavalry man and um, they, they lost that, well not lost but they weren't used so much to get off their horse and, and act as, as um, infantry. They, they were far more useful in a charge as cavalry. So that's a British Dragoon, and again, all nations had Dragoons. And there's the smaller one that you'll see on the miniature battlefield. Um, fighting. Okay. He's got a lot of kit on him. He's a rather dashing looking fellow. This particular one is, uh, he's from a regiment called the Scotch Greys and all their horses were grey, which is why they were called that. And they fought at the Battle of Waterloo, captured a French flag uh, and got themselves pretty mangled up by the um, Lancers, Polish Lancers, who we'll see shortly. Every army has their um, elitist units and this person here is from the first lifeguard so he's the top of the range cavalry for the British you can see there that he's got a, a, a carb, carbine and uh, a lot although he hasn't got it out he's, his sword is a long straight sword as well and he's got a metal helmet he's heavy cavalry and um, well trained experienced and uh, there's the small one that uh, we use in the war games lifeguard cavalry uh, they're probably um, value comes from um, the experience uh, uh, that they have and the time they spent in service which uh, just made them extremely efficient okay now we're going to move over to a couple of french cavalry pieces um, have a look at them okay now we're looking at a french crucio and the reason he's called a Crissio is he's wearing a cuirass, which uh, is a piece, a piece of armour on the front and back of the chest, and a steel helmet. Uh, some armies had 
cavalry that they called demi crasses where they only wore the, the front half of the crass. He is basically left over from the the last of the knights coming down. Uh, this idea, he was a, it was heavy. He needed a big horse. He was not slow, but the armor protected him a lot from musket balls. So um, that uh, in, increased his chance of survival. And uh, also the slashing from enemy swords, etc. So he was a particularly hard person to deal with. As you can see that big, long, straight, heavy sword there to slash with. Uh, he also carries a, a carbine and a pistol with him. And there's the, the 72nd scale model of it that you would see on the wargaming tables when you hopefully watch the battles that uh, uh, I run for you. They are <clears throat> hard-hitting shock cavalry of the French and um, were well regarded by all nations as a dangerous foe. So French Carissier. And the last model I have for you today is a Polish Lancer. Now remember, you might remember earlier on I was talking about the British soldier and his brown best musket with that long bayonet on it. Form squares to keep the cavalry at bay. Well, it didn't work with lances because that lance uh, could outreach that uh, rifle and bayonet, which made these troops very dangerous to cavalry, uh, to infantry. When they were attacking cavalry, of course, with the lance, they get the first uh, attack in. But once the uh, the melee closes, then the lance becomes actually a bit of a hindrance to them. So they did have a sword, and uh, I think maybe one of the tactics might have been to get rid of the lance then and pull the sword, but um, he also carries a musket with him, short rifle, a carbine rather, I take that back, carbine, short rifle. He's particularly beautiful uniform, and he's Polish. So what was he doing in um, the French army? Well, when the French uh, invaded Poland, this set of uh, cavalry fought so well, Napoleon was so impressed with them, he took them and incorporated them into the French army. Not only into the army, but into the guard component of the army. So they were very special and uh, served him very well. Uh, all nations had uh, lances. Um, they, were, they were reconnaissance troops as well. They were more light cavalry than heavy. Although that's that might be debatable, but um, yep. So down here we have the seventy second model of the Polish lancers, and uh, I don't know if you're watching uh, my um, battles that I put uh, forward to you. They f they featured in the Brenham uh, Ridge battle. So that's uh, the miniature of them and that's the 30 second scale model of them. And that's the end of this particular series. Um, the Airfix collection I have has a lot more models in it, but they're not Napoleonic. They range into other areas, um, but um, so we won't, we won't go there. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. It gives you perhaps a little bit more appreciation of uh, what the... Um, cavalry and the infantry man carried into battle and um, how actually beautiful some of these uniforms were even though you don't see that sort of detail in the, the miniature there. All right, uh, I'm going to do another series soon on the tactics uh, of the Napoleonic battle so that you watch that and you'll get a little understanding of what's happening when you watch the actual uh, battles that I present in the future. So look forward to that one. Um, thanks again, everyone. See you soon. Bye.